G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I wanted to do a uh, kind of a different kind of look at some of the most improved players in the competition this year, but not so much with that angle, more so looking at players who have really shifted the narrative around the quality of play they are, and uh, in other words, players that kind of proved us wrong. In some cases, it were players that did prove me wrong personally, but also, you know, in response to what the public perception was and players that have really surprised us. So I've got 10 players here who I felt met the criteria of this video. We might all disagree because, you know, it's a little bit arbitrary, a little bit subjective around what our own personal opinions might have been of that player to begin with. It's a little bit like doing AFL underrated, overrated. But nonetheless, these are 10 players here who I think are worthy of some credit for this season. So to start off, I'm going to give you a big slice of Eagles bias pie. And I do think that no list will be complete without Jake Waterman here. And, uh, you know, being an Eagles fan, I can give some insight as to, you know, the Eagles fan perception as much as anything else. So I do imagine for most people who don't support West Coast, Jake Waterman wouldn't have been a very well-known player. You know, you would have known him by name, but outside of that, I don't imagine that everyone in the AFL world will have an opinion on who he was as a player. And I say that respectfully. Internally, amongst West Coast fans, there was a division around whether or not he would be a long-term player. I myself always saw the value in him, Whatever way you slice it, though, he's exceeded those expectations. I never would have foreseen a time that, you know, after nine games of the AFL season, as I'm currently recording, he's ranked first for goals per game. He's ranked second for marks inside 50 per game, sixth in contested marks in general for an undersized key forward. He's 190 centimeters, which for context, I think makes him the same height as Elliot Yo. Seventh for score involvements. He's kicked multiple goals in every game since round three, and he's already beaten the most goal he's ever kicked in a season, which was previously 18. I think he's sitting on like 24 at the moment. He's kicked bags of five and six this year. I mean, he's have to be one of the in competition's most improved players. On a similar vein, I'm going to go with Essendon's Sam Durham. Now, was there a perception that Sam Durham wasn't good before? Probably not. And that's where we get a little bit messy with the criteria. Nonetheless, still one of the uh, competition's most improved players. And if you look at it from the perspective of he wasn't drafted through the conventional drafting system, he was taking the 2021 mid-season draft. Undoubtedly, there were people out there, you know, recruiters or whatever, who didn't necessarily think he was going to make the grade. And yet, he tracks to be one of the most improved players again in 2024. When you look at the, the stats, he's just about doubled his contested possessions this year. And we've seen a market move from, you know, more of a wing role to more of an inside role lately. And, you know, his contested possessions doubled. Uncontested possessions have also improved. He's winning more of the footy generally. He's winning four times as many clearances as last year. He's getting three times as many inside 50s, four and a half tackles a game compared to 1.8. He's gone up in meters gain, score involvements, and he's playing more of an inside role. So did he necessarily prove people wrong? I'm not sure if he fits that criteria, but he definitely has the move the needle in terms of public perception around Sam Durham. And I do think he's one of, not the only piece, but one of the more important drivers in Essendon's improvement this year. And he tracks to be a very good AFL player on his current trajectory. Now let's talk about Jesse Hogan. This one is also an interesting one. And again, it depends on your perception of him because when he left Fremantle, he was sort of on the trajectory of somebody who had failed to hit the potential of their career. As it turns out, as I look at this statistically, he's actually had a very good career at GWS from the beginning. You know, he's pretty much been going in more than two goals a game. In fact, he's kicked 130 goals from 58 games. But in terms of public perception, Jesse Hogan now is, I think, as I record this, second in the Coleman. 26 goals from nine games, bearing in mind I'm recording this halfway through round 10. He kicked 49 goals from 23 last year, and he's continued that extremely well. So if you're watching him closely last year, you might have thought back into last year was really where the improvement started to really generate for Jesse Hogan but the fact that he's continued that and showed that it wasn't necessarily you know a flash in the pan or anything like that he's continued that trajectory he's still a very good player he's number one in the competition for marks inside 50 and eighth for contested marks and again in terms of public perception shifting Jesse Hogan is one of the best examples of this I'm going to give you a couple of Fremantle examples of players that have probably proven us wrong and they used to be good players and have now reminded us that they're still very good players. So the first one is the captain Alex Pierce, who seems to be unanimously considered just about a lock for the All-Australian team if it was picked today. In, in terms of specifically his role as a lockdown defender, in the first month, I think he had opponents like Charlie Curno, uh, Harry Mackay at some points. Nick Larkey also did a very good job on. Um, there was a, a game against the Adelaide Crows, I think was one of his best games of the season. Being a wa base fan, or at least I used to be, I was always aware that Alex Pierce was a good player, and I know that he's battled with injuries. The fact that he's only trickled over 100 games very recently really speaks to that. But now he's just about in career best form. He's 28 years old, and again, proven 
anyone wrong who might have thought he was past his best. And the same goes for Nat 5. Now, is he past his best? Probably when you consider his best is up here. Like, dual Brownlow medalist, 2019 was his last truly elite season. Since then, we've seen Nat 5 really struggle to get back to his best form and, and you know part of that is fitness and conditioning and he's battling so many issues which is probably a byproduct of the way that he played throughout his career he shifted forward in my opinion was never a natural forward and didn't particularly play well in that role 13 disposals and 15 disposals a game last year and you know not too many goals this year while he's not back to his Brownlow medal form I will give him a lot of credit for really stepping up as a genuine inside midfielder again 22 touches a game sounds modest, but there also has been some managing there. He's been subbed out once. Five and a half clearances, three tackles. He's well and truly playing his role and looks much more suited playing in his more natural inside mid role. So again, a player that probably makes this list because many people might have assumed we've seen the best in that five and we probably have in a literal sense, but he has come back in a big way and deserves some credit. I want to throw Jake String into this mix, a second Essendon player for this list. Um, you know, I think in the preseason, I was sort of, sheepishly saying, I think Jake String is going to have a good year. And I wasn't the only one. And part of that was the contract status thing. He's out of contract at the end of this year, but I think um, he, he has actually had a bit of an underrated impact this year, depending on you know what your perception is. 2021, he was outstanding. He kicked 41 goals that year. He's only played for 32 games since. Um, and you know part of that has been the shape he's been in, and it's probably largely due to injury. But 17 goals from nine games this year, he's taking more marks and genuinely had a much more positive influence. And again, one of those players that shapes part of Essendon's resurgence this year, you know, I don't know if it's one player that's necessarily done it. I feel like there's been four or five. Nick Martin is another big one who's taken a big step. The reason I don't have Nick Martin in this uh, as compared to the others is I think we'd seen enough of Nick Martin previously, like last year, to suggest that a big year could be coming. Now, he's probably exceeded anyone's realistic expectations, but I would differentiate Nick Martin from guys like Sam Durham, who probably didn't have a profile at all, and Jake Stringer, who probably copped a lot of criticism. I want to highlight North Melbourne's ruckman this year, Tristan Cherry, who's having a very, very good season and probably underrated. Now, I won't lie to you. You know, I, I think I did a ranking of ruck combos at the start of the year, um, and, you know, so many shifting opinions from what I had at the start of the year and that was largely based on last year's form and I would argue, you know, different players are playing well now. But Tristan Cherry... I, I thought, you know, would struggle as the number one ruck this year, but it's been the exact opposite. He's averaging 33 hitouts a game. He's fourth in the league for tackles per game, eighth in the league for clearances, and he's getting about 15 and a half possessions a game. So it's a huge uplift in possessions and hitouts on any other year. I know he played nine games last year, went down with injury. I know there was some encouraging form, but he still doubled his clearances on the encouraging form we saw last year. So a player who's been given a lot more responsibility that I, to be honest, personally, was a little bit skeptical he would be up to the challenge. Maybe that's harsh. Maybe I didn't think he wouldn't be up to the challenge, but I, I probably never saw this level of impact coming from Tristan Cherry, who's really stood up once Goldstein's, you know, gone to Essendon. I think he's having a great year. Now, I'm going to put Isaac Henney in this list. Is that contentious? Probably. I mean, he was all Australian two years ago. Here's my logic for it, though. I don't know if anyone would have seen him becoming such a good midfielder as he is now, because I think in 2022, he was primarily a forward. I think he hit 49 goals that year. 2023, had a real downturn in form and, you know, famously had the yips in front of goal, 29 goals, 29 or something like that. And I'm sure it's fair to say that there was some doubt that Isaac Henney would be one of those talents that maybe you never really saw hit their potential. And then this year, what he's done has been absolutely outrageous. Did I say outrageous? I did. Outrageous. He's spending more time at the center bounces than any other Sydney midfielder. And it's probably been the silver lining of some preseason injuries we all know about. 27 disposals a game, a goal and a half a game as well. So he's still hitting the scoreboard. He's also got a very balanced contested and uncontested game. So he's a truly, truly is an inside outside midfielder. There is no argument to be made for the fact that, you know, he's a front runner or anything like that. Not that I've seen anyone say that, but when you've got a classy, skillful player who can hit the scoreboard, you generally have those guys forward of the ball or receiving the footy, but he's doing a really good job of winning his own footy too. Six and a half clearances a game. I still think this probably does count as a play that has has shifted public perception because of a poor year last year and the fact that he's doing it in a new role. I'm also going to throw Matthew Rao is a player that has shifted public perception with an outstanding year this year. Now, trajectory of his career has been interesting. You know, started the first five games of his career is, you know, looking like the next Chris Judd. Injuries have been a big factor in, in him, you know, being curtailed over the following few years. And even last year, I saw, you know, the the core of a very good inside midfielder that probably needed to round out his game a little bit better. And this year, the improvement has been stark. And, you know, I think it was a few weeks ago, he was ranked top five by champion data 
in terms of plays in the competition. I think ranked number two, like previously to that. Number one contested possession player in the game. He's number one in clearances and specifically number one in center clearances and stoppage clearances. So he's number one in all three stats. He's number one in tackles per game and number two in tackles overall. Bear in mind, I'm recording this after Gold Coast have played Geelong and before the rest of the round. So that's going to be iffy, but still per game, number one tackle player. Top 20 for score involvements and number 16 for goal assists too. So he's also impacting outside of the contest. His uncontested ball is still, you know, disproportionately small. No doubt he's primarily an inside ball, but he's impacting the game outside of that. Winning more, slightly more uncontested ball. His efficiency is better. He's getting more inside 50s. He's getting more meters gained. And I think, again, public perception has shifted on the basis of him being outrageously good this year. But people might disagree with the criteria on that one. And lastly, as my 10th player, I might slot Bailey Dale into this conversation. Um, you know, I think it's been an interesting narrative around him because it wasn't that long ago he got dropped to sub for the Western Bulldogs. But you look at it, and, and specifically, if you listen to champion data, he's actually having an outrageously good year. A few weeks ago, he was ranked the third best player in the competition. Now, the, I'm going to quote Hoiney, who said this, Bailey Dale is the absolute pin-up example of a towards goal player. He uses the ball extremely well, which this rating system recognizes and rewards significantly. He's now been a top 10 player in three of the last four years. So again, I know that people are skeptical of champion data, and I'm not saying that you need to not be skeptical of it, but at least you hear the justification for that. He's a high meters gained player. He uses the ball well, and generally it's in a productive way towards the goals. 24 disposals a game at 500 meters gained. He uses the ball at 81%, and he gets 5.2 intercepts per game. So that's the statistical background for him having a fantastic season. And again, this is probably another player who's subverted expectations and probably over the stretch, not even just this year, but over the stretch, has been quietly a very good player. I think we're like three or four years removed from his All-Australian, but probably another player that proves a few people wrong. And perhaps Luke Beveridge is one of those people. Anyway, guys, that is just my suggestions for some of the players that proved us wrong this year so far. But let me know in the comments anyone I missed, anyone you agree with or disagree with, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.